Good morning and welcome to your university, Montana State. I'm Wadet Cruzado and I'm honored to serve as president of this great institution. So today is a historic day for Montana State University and for the state of Montana. And I'm so glad that all of you, our students, our faculty, staff, alumni, elected officials, and many dear friends of MSU have been able to join us. Thank you. We're fortunate to have with us this morning some very special guests. I would like to extend a special welcome to the governor of the great state of Montana, Steve Bullock. Montana Commissioner of Higher Education, Clayton Christian. <laughs> A member of the Board of Regents and Mayor of the City of Bozeman, Mr. Jeff Krause. <laughs> the Dean of the College of Engineering, Dr. Brett Gunnick. The CEO of the MSU Alumni Foundation, Dr. Kathleen Saylor. <laughs> the president of the Associated Students of MSU, Lindsay Murdoch. <laughs> we have extended invitations also to a number of our state legislators. If you're here, would you please stand up or raise your hands? Okay. <laughs> and I also would like to recognize our alumnus and generous donor, Mr. Jake Japs, class of 1952, and his daughter, Terry. In addition to our local and state dignitaries, it is my pleasure to introduce a very special guest a distinguished alumnus, a good friend of MSU, and the man who has brought us here today, Mr. Norm Asbjornsson. <laughs> Norm is very well known in our College of Engineering, where faculty, students, and staff recognize his name as synonymous of success and generosity. Let me tell you some salient facts about this extraordinary man. He is a 1960 mechanical engineering graduate of Montana State College and a native of Winifred, Montana. After graduating, Norm spent the next 28 years working his way up in the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning business until he founded Aeon in 1988 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Aon has been profitable since the day it first opened its doors under Norm's management. Today, Aon has more than 1,400 employees and annual revenues in excess of $300 million. And during Norm's long and impressive career, he has always been a true friend to Montana State University and to his hometown of Winifred. In 2003, Norm endowed a $1 million scholarship fund at MSU for graduates from Montana high schools with few, fewer than 100 students. He also has created an endowed scholarship specifically for graduates of Winifred High School who attend MSU and he created an endowment for the Burns Technology Center to develop innovative distance learning programs for rural Montana schools. In 2006, Norm gave more than $600,000 in cash, equipment, and technical advice to create a one-of-a-kind HVAC laboratory in MSU's Department of Mechanical Engineering. His company gives research grants to the College of Engineering on a continuing basis, and he has hired numerous MSU engineering graduates. 
Norm has been a generous philanthropist to his own hometown of Winifred as well. In recognition of his achievements and contributions to the betterment of Montana, MSU, and the Montana Board of Regents, he was awarded an honorary doctorate in engineering in 2004. It is an amazing success story of a man who started from humble beginnings. A child of the Great Depression, Norm grew up with his parents, Eric and Boots, in an 800 square foot house with no indoor plumbing, no running water, no telephone, and no electricity. He often points out that the house didn't stay at 800 square feet. His parents added to it twice. Norm's parents were loving and kind, and he has often recounted, quote, I didn't feel like I was missing anything. It was a good life. He grew up used to hard work and using his wits. By the time he was six years old, he was driving tractors for farmers and selling soda pop and newspapers for money. By the time he was 10, his uncle offered him a Model T in return for feeding and watering hundreds of chickens. For an entire summer, Norm hauled hundreds of gallons of waters to the chickens from a well a block away using two small pails. Satisfied with his hard work, when payday finally arrived, he learned the Model T had been covered in a flood, the engine too rusted to start. Undeterred, he worked on the car in his father's garage until it ran. Then he became his own boss and went into business hauling garbage for 25 cents a barrel. He thought he was making a lot of money. Norm's inspirational story is a testament to the caring upbringing provided by his parents, whom he describes as giving him two of the greatest gifts, perseverance and independence. And it is a story with many chapters that unfolded thanks to education. In Norm's own words, quote, I wouldn't have a prayer without education. And during this entire journey, one that started with a six-year-old boy driving tractors and which led to a man building a company into one recognized by Forbes as one of the 100 best small companies in America, Norm has never lost his sense of gratitude, his sense of responsibility, his sense of stewardship. In his own words, he has said, quote, I think it's an absolute must for everyone to give back to what made them successful. I had a lot of help from MSU and Winifred. I can't repay those who helped me for their gun, but I can give to the next generation. I think everyone should balance the books and thank those people and institutions who helped them and also give to the next generation. It's a responsibility we all have." End of quote. Today, my dear friends, faculty, students, alums, benefactors of Montana State University, I'm pleased to announce that generations of students will be forever touched by Norm's incredible sense of stewardship and responsibility. This morning, I'm humbled to announce that Norm Asby Jornsson has committed to Montana State University and its College of Engineering the largest gift in the history of the state of Montana, $50 million. Thank you, Norm. With this gift, MSU intends to construct the Norm Asby Jornsson Innovation Center, 
an innovative laboratory and classroom facility that will empower our students and faculty in collaborative, hands-on learning and leadership. The building is envisioned to promote dynamic interdisciplinary engagement, meaningful student-faculty interaction, and accelerated innovation that responds to and anticipates emerging trends in education, industry, and society. Open to all and anchored in the university's growing engineering programs, the building funded by Norm's gift will bring to life an enduring state-of-the-art asset that erects bridges between academic programs, serves today's outstanding students and faculty, and supports how learning and leadership will occur long into the future. Norm's gift will transform the lives of generations of students. It will transform the campus permanently, and it will transform the state of Montana in profound ways. Once again, thank you, Norm. At this moment, an honor to introduce the governor of the state of Montana, Governor Steve Bullock. Thank you, President Cruzado. It truly is an incredible day today. It's a day when we can show the rest of the world and the nation the character of this great state and how businessmen like Norm as Bjornsson can partner with higher education to make a better future for all Montanans. This gift really is the embodiment of the Montana spirit, a spirit of generosity in giving back to those who helped you along the path. Mr. M Mr. S. Bjornsson's gift will improve the lives of generations of Montanans, not just those students who attend col the college at Montana State, but also those who will benefit from the ideas born of the College of Engineering years and generations into the future. It is the embodiment of two pillars of our future, innovation and education, both of which will make our state and our nation even stronger. The gift will also have a huge impact on the economies of Bozeman and Montana. This impact will be felt immediately in the jobs created to construct the facility and will be con continue to be felt as Montana is able to recruit and retain businesses, businesses who recognize the value of our workforce, work ethic, business climate, and quality of life. I want to be clear, though, this isn't just a gift. It truly is a partnership that you're creating today, Norm. Mr. Asbjornsson has made an investment in the state of Montana, and we aim to show great returns from those who come out of the College of Engineering as innovators, research groundbreakers, and as entrepreneurs. Mr. Asbjornsson, on behalf of all of Montana, thank you for your amazing act of generosity and your investment in the future of your home and collectively all of our state. Now I'd like to introduce Commissioner of Higher Education, Clayton Christian. Thank you, Governor. It's certainly an honor to have you here today as well as it marks the importance and the magnitude of this gift. So on behalf of the Montana University System, I too would like to extend our deepest gratitude to Mr. Asbjornsson and his family for the tremendous gift to our students and to future generations of Montanans. Norm's generosity and contribution towards student success have proven strong for many years. Montana students have already benefited greatly from Norm's past gifts of scholarship funding, startup funding for technology programs, and this and his technical expertise as an industry leader. And now, on top of all that, another gift, the largest private gift in our state's history. This gift will build cutting edge facilities and provide modern resources to help current and future generations of students to be leaders in this fast moving world. It really is a pleasure to digest the words of wisdom that Norm has shared on past occasions while here at Montana State University when he has invested in students 
in Montana. What strikes me is how much he cares about Montana and Montana students having opportunities to overcome challenges. Whether it's geographical challenges, economic challenges, whatever the case may be, Norm's dedication to helping Montanans access high quality education is a remarkable passion and an incredible opportunity for the Montana University system and the entire state. It is striking to me the wisdom and dedication Norm shares with others as he describes his perspective on the value of education, his message about the inherent knowledge gained through education, the importance of developing a better understanding of the world around us, and the correlation of this knowledge into everyday life and the happiness it brings is a very powerful message. Norm's generosity has lived up to his words time and time again. On behalf of the students, the educators, the Montana Board of Regents, the entire Montana University system, we express our sincere gratitude. Norm, thank you for this incredible gift. <laughs> now I'd like to welcome to the podium our member of the Board of Regents and our mayor of the great city of Bozeman, Mr. Jeff Krause. Mayors love places. Mayors um, have a sense of place, and they love places. And one of the places I love in Montana is Winifred. I, I, uh, it's where the Judith starts its tumble down to the Missouri. And as you know, we send the Missouri out of Montana to uh, nurture the heartland of America. And yeah, I think that's a metaphor. I do. Um, it's a place of hard work and independence that grows the exemplars of the American dream as naturally as the prairie grasses on the high plains or the cottonwoods in the Missouri River bottom. When the country calls, when the job needs doing, when the problem has to be solved with the tools at hand, when the answer is to build it yourself, so often it's the calloused hands of rural America responding, like the hands of of those who grew up in the Plains communities like Winifred. In Mr. Esbjornsson's own words, what needed adding was education. His story is the Montana story, and it's one of the region's graduates from all of Montana's universities are in high demand. It's why the engineering schools of MSU and Montana Tech are flooded with recruiters, and it's why Montana's public universities challenge even the best in the world. And in a near year named by Dr. Cruzado the year of engaged leadership, it's why those who rise to the challenge of engagement are already engaged, creating, building, hiring, leading. When I thank you today, Mr. Asmorensen, it's not just to thank you for the donation and the opportunities that donation provides for men and women from the farms and ranches and towns and cities of Montana from now and to the foreseeable future, although that is worthy of many thanks. But much more than that, I thank you for the example of the life you are leading, a reminder of, to all of us and of, what all, and of all that inspires us as Montanans and Americans, invention and hard work and public service and giving back. Montana's gold and silver is no longer just found in the ground. It's found in your contribution, your example, your legacy to our daughters and sons. For all of our emphasis on science and technology and engineering and math, a justifiable emphasis in the world we find today and we will find tomorrow. For all of our focus on these tools provided by education, you remind us again it is the raw material of Montana's families growing up in Montana's towns who will reinvent our state and our nation. Montana's people are willing to take those tools of education and build and dare and dream and give back. As a member of the Board of Regents and from the cities and towns all across Montana, Thank you for your gift that will add that education you needed and we need and generations need to come. And thank you for your work and thank you for your example. <laughs> and, and now I'd like to introduce Dean Brad Gunnick.
Thank you, Mayor Krause. Mr. Absborn, better start that one again. Mr. Asbjornson, on behalf of all the students, faculty, staff, and alumni in the College of Engineering, thank you so very, very much. This is the kind of thing deans and faculty members dream about for their students, that a philanthropist like yourself would come forward and provide the means to give our students a stellar education. The College of Engineering has been growing rapidly and your gift couldn't come at a better time to help us take our teaching, research, and service to their next level of excellence. From the fall of 2008 to the fall of 2013, the College of Engineering grew from 2,090 students to its current 3,102 students, 48.4% growth. During this amazing growth, the college has attracted extraordinary faculty members, filling six new tenure track positions in the last two years to support the growth of the college. Provost Martha Potvin also provided financial support for the teaching of additional sections. The college has also seen a significant increase in graduate students, a teaching, graduate teaching assistant budget. Graduate TAs provide critical teaching support for our laboratory rich curriculums. We have also worked collaboratively with the MSU Advanced Program to improve the gender diversity of our faculty. In the last two years, we have hired six women tenure track faculty members, increasing the number of women faculty to 13. Despite the growth in terms of faculty, students, and staff, there has been no significant addition to our teaching or laboratory space since the completion of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Building, which we are now standing in since 1997. Norm, with your gift, we'll be able to create a building where students and faculty from across disciplines can collaborate on technologies, research, and ideas that will shape the future. This will be a game changer for our growing student body, for engineering education, community engagement, for research and economic development in Montana. All of us in the College of Engineering are humbled by your support, and we will do everything to live up to the confidence you have shown in us. I would now like to introduce uh, Dr. Kathleen Saylor, President of the Montana State University Alumni Foundation. Thank you, Dean Gunnick, both for your leadership here at MSU and for this opportunity to be part of today's very, very special announcement. Mr. Esbjornsson, on behalf of the MSU Foundation, including our members, our donors, and our volunteers, let me join all of those who have come before me to say thank you for your inspiring generosity. Let me also say thank you for your remarkable leadership and your volunteer service. As a former chairman of the Foundation's Board of Governors as a, and as a continuing member of the Engineering Advisory Board, your service has helped to lay the groundwork for the excellence and the potential we celebrate at MSU today. This transformative gift will create remarkable and immediate benefits for our students, for our faculty, and for the communities we aim to serve. As President Crisado and Dean Gunnick have both said so eloquently, this new facility will enable interdisciplinary learning, new innovative leadership, and adapting to new changes and new opportunities in our fast-changing world. And your generosity will carry us forward in different ways as well. Our good friend Jake Jabs is with us here today. We know that he had given his gift in support of the new College of Business and Entrepreneurship with the hope that it would raise the bar for philanthropy at MSU and across our state. And clearly it did so. So too does your extraordinary commitment set a new standard for what's possible in supporting our beloved university. We are extremely grateful for and excited about your unprecedented gift, and we're also ready as alumni and friends of the university 
to build on the incredible opportunities your gift creates for MSU and our community. Thank you so very much for what you have done. And it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Lindsay Murdoch, President of the Associated Students of Montana State University. Looks like I missed the hype memo on that one. Thank you, Dr. Saylor, and thank you, Mr. Asbjornson. We are so appreciative of this incredible donation, one that will enhance the education of thousands of engineering students and students from all across campus. Thank you for your commitment to Montana State University and my fellow Bobcats. We all know that the College of Engineering is full of world-renowned faculty and students making headlines all over the world, but its incredible reputation has led to clamp cramped classrooms, lab spaces, and offices. Your investment in infrastructure is timely and will help to ensure that our faculty and students are not hindered by a lack of space or the state-of-the-art technology as they continue to engineer the future. And most of all, a sincere thank you for your unwavering commitment to education. Through your previous creation of endowed scholarships and your service to our foundation and the College of Engineering Advisory Council, you have made a habit of turning principles into action. And this speaks volume for our faculty, staff, students, and alumni. You've been quoted as saying that it's an absolute must for everyone to give back to what has made them successful. And this sense of responsibility to your home community of Winifred and also to MSU sets a powerful precedent for the state. As a student who believes wholeheartedly in the grant land grant mission, I have a deep respect for those who have committed their lives to living it out. Thank you for setting this example for me and for all of my fellow students. I am humbled to be here today as we launch this college and this university into the future. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of it. And furthermore, thank you for investing in students and in the future of Montana. And with that, it's now my pleasure to turn the podium back over to President Crusado. Thank you, Governor Bullock, Commissioner Christian, Mayor Krause, Dean Gunnick, CEO Saylor, and President Murdoch. Look at this. <laughs> In so many ways, Mr. Asby Jornsson is the embodiment of what Congressman Justin Morrow envisioned when he worked to create the nation's system of public higher education through the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862, of which Montana State University is a proud example. Through institutions like Montana State University, Congressman Morrill and President Lincoln hoped that sons and daughters of the working families of America could receive a higher education that would make them better citizens in our democracy and allow them to prosper economically. Norm S. Bjornsson is the promise of the land-grant universities fulfilled. Education empowered him, and now he's empowering the future of generations to come. It is now my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, faculty, students, staff, advisory board members, donors, friends, benefactors, Please join me in welcoming to the podium Mr. Norm Asbjornsson. I did not come with a prepared speech. I thought I would wing it once I saw what was going on. <laughs> and I have a couple messages that I would like to try and convey. Number one, I will walk you through very quickly a little bit of my background, which is portrayed up here in the 
upper level, and I'm shocked that it is, but I'm glad that it is. And a little bit of the philosophy I've tried to live my life by. On the far left there is my first baby picture in the backyard of a house which still exists, looking at a house which still exists in Winterfred. Both of them have been upgraded considerably and added on from them. My father holding me and my mother standing there. And my dog Spike off the other side. <laughs> As I wander around here and follow them, I see you have my aerobatic flying aircraft there. And then I see that you have a picture that was taken earlier this year when I was in Korea. And I was at their war memorial and looking at a tank, which I believe I probably worked on because there weren't many of that particular model in Korea during the war. I was there after the war as a mechanic. And I pulled engines out and tuned up engines and changed oil and did a lot of things to make them run. I checked the 90 millimeter guns out to make sure they'd fire 50 caliber machine guns to make sure they would work. Next one happens to be when I received my honorary doctorate here. The next picture, uh, I mean, oh, there's Winifred Montana. <laughs> the following one happened on September 30th when I opened NASDAQ with a bunch of my employees and my directors, and we celebrated our 25th anniversary. And as we come on around, I cannot see, oh, one of my early pictures as a child, and then when I was a teenager standing by a 47 Studebaker in, in Day Street in front of my house in Winifred, Montana during a winter, my high school graduation picture, and my first really major business venture. <laughs> I was very fortunate for having been born in the United States. And while I think most of you share that for good fortune, some of you are here maybe from other countries. But I consider it to be an extreme privilege that we all share to live in this fine country. I also happen to have had a very, very good fortune of having absolutely exceptional parents. And while they went through their early years during the Depression, I do remember some of the hardships as a child. I remember my mother counting pennies to find out how much we could eat. I remember a lot of things which fixed my character to some degree. And they decided that the best thing they could give to me as a child was the ability to survive regardless of whatever. And in that thought pattern, they never gave me any allowance. I was never given a penny of allowance in my entire life. What they had were certain jobs that were my problems because I was a member of the family. But there were other jobs they could give me a penny or a nickel for. And at that time, my biggest money-making venture, I remember, was collecting pop bottles and beer bottles and selling them back to the store and back to the bar for a penny apiece. I delivered papers, did a variety of things, worked for farmers, shocked hay, did all kinds of shoveling of wheat, and all driving tractors and all the various things that farm kids do at that time. I don't know that they are so privileged today because our federal government has made that illegal for a lot of those endeavors. Real shame, real shame, because today's children don't get that opportunity, as I did, to learn responsibilities. And my first big venture, which she told you about, and if you had your garbage in a 55-gallon drum, I charged a quarter. If you threw it out on the ground and I had to collect it up, it cost you 50 cents. <laughs> I was a real hard businessman. <laughs> When I came down to Montana State College at the time, I was not the best prepared student they ever received. Because of Winifred having a lack of certain things, I had only had one year of algebra and one year of solid geometry, no chemistry, no physics. And I came down here thinking I was going to be an engineer because I knew how to do mechanics work. Well, 
Wasn't quite mechanics work down here. So they sent me off to take remedial math so that I could get into the college level of math. That automatically kind of displaced me from my original class. I started here in the fall of 53. Should have gone out of here in the fall in uh, 57. But I was already behind the eight ball. And when I walked into chemistry and I walked into physics and all these other students had had those courses and I was sitting in there wondering what's going on in this course, it was a trial. And I struggled. I struggled. When I went down to come to, came here first, my parents gave me $1,000. I had about five to $600 of my own, and that got me through the first year. I worked the summer between, and I came back here with probably $500 or so in the fall of 54, and I went through the fall quarter. It was on a quarterly system then. Started the winter year, or the winter quarter, and realized I was going to have to go ask my parents for money because I was running out of money. I also realized at that time that most everybody went through the military, so I said, hmm, why don't I just go ahead and solve two problems at one time? I'll go in and get my military service over with, and I won't have to ask my parents for any money. Now, my parents at that time had, had a, a fairly good lifestyle. They had grown, gotten to be fairly prosperous, one of the most prosperous families in the town of Winifred. So they could easily have afforded me money. And I look back at what I did and say, was I really very smart right then? Like a lot of things. And one of the things that I will tell you for sure, that I fully believe, those who are the most successful are also those who have failed the most. Because you don't get successful unless you reach far and try hard. And when you reach far and try hard, the likelihoods of failure are greatly magnified. And so I reached hard down here to get my education. And I didn't set the world on fire. I was not one of the star performers in this school. I had a lot of good friends. I had a lot of good classmates. But I was kind of the middle section of the class. But I did do one thing. At that time, the college had to accept all the graduates of Montana State Colleges, I mean, of the Montana State high schools, and they had an abundance of classmates in here. And the thing of the faculty at that time was to thin it down so they didn't have to work so hard because we didn't, <laughs> we didn't pay too much money, so why did they want to keep us around? And so they flunked out about two-thirds of my starting class. They didn't quite get me, but they came close. <laughs> so when I came back out of the military, I had spent nine months on the DMZ sleeping with a machine gun in my sleeping bag with me. There was no fighting going on but it was within 15 minute walking distance from people who wanted to kill me. And when you go to bed every night, get in your sleeping bag in an unair conditioned, under he unheated tent or a hole in the ground, which was what it was there. It was after the fighting, but it was still pretty primitive. And you lived a very primitive life and you worked seven days a week all the time because there was nothing else there because above the Jim River and the fence that surround the DMC, there were no Koreans allowed up there. We were told, you see anybody that's not obviously an American citizen, shoot them. And it was a serious thing. I grew up quickly under that scenario, realized what life was about. I left there, I left Korea, fortunately on plane on December 25th, 1956, and I was enrolled in school back here on Ju July, I mean January 4th, 1957. A handful of days from the right time I left Korea until I was sitting right here back in school. I was a much more serious student. I realized that if I were going to achieve my goals and not live the life I had just come from, that I was going to have to get very serious, and I got very serious. I graduated from here in 1960 with a mechanical engineering degree. 
I had a little economy car, car called a Rambler because you got a lot of car for a little bunny. Put all my personal belongings that I own in the trunk of the car, didn't even have to use the back seat, and started for Minneapolis where I began my first job. I've had a very fortunate career because I had a very fortunate thing happen to me. I was a graduate of MSC. And what I found out in the world was while I was in awe of people from these very prestigious colleges and universities that are within the United States and some foreign, funny thing happened. As the conversations went around engineering, I never got lost. I was always there with them. I might not be quite as adept in a particular field and be able to talk in as deep a depth as they were, but the conversation could switch from one subject to the next and I was there. I came to realize how tremendous my engineering education was. Absolutely tremendous. And I also realized there was a deficiency in my education. I was very technical, I was very much an engineer, but I wasn't very much of a manager, and I wasn't very much in a lot of other areas. So by that time, I was working as a salesman in Omaha, Nebraska, selling commercial heating and air conditioning units, largely to schools, hospitals, office buildings, shopping centers, things of that nature. And there was a university there called Omaha University, now known as University of Nebraska Omaha Campus. And so I enrolled in there for night courses to try and broaden my obvious lack of knowledge in areas that I realized that if I was ever going to rise above a technician in an engineering world and be a manager or be something greater, I needed more knowledge. And I went many years to night school to obtain that. And then I started getting promoted. I started having a reputation of being a fixer for problems in the sales world. And I was moved from the manager of that office to the manager of the Detroit office, the manager of the Chicago office. And then they put the Midwestern United States over me and they sent me for a while, and then they sent me to Dallas, Texas, and I covered the West Coast and the Southwest for a while. And then I was made national sales manager for a large corporation. That was my first 12 years out of school. So I've been in an executive position with four large corporations since 1972, in charge of worldwide sales, in charge of product management, in charge of engineering for some of them, a variety of jobs. And throughout that time, failure, success, failure, success, just went back and forth because I was always reaching higher. I was never satisfied with what I had obtained. I was never satisfied with what the company had done. The most crucial thing that I realized, what was taught to me so clearly by my parents, was honesty and forthright. And honesty doesn't come just for being honest from me to you. The biggest lack of honesty we all have is with ourselves. We say, you know, I could have done that, but that person or that situation prevented me from doing it. No, 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 you were part of it. Look in the mirror and correct that which you have control over. Find out what you did wrong and correct it. These are some of the lessons my life has taught me. And it has worked extraordinarily well for me. I was an executive in a firm in Minneapolis at the time that I was courted by a headhunter to come down and take over an extremely small firm in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they courted me for approximately one year because I had a reputation of being able to fix companies and fix situations. So what did I do? I shoveled the snow again when it snowed. In Minneapolis, it snows a lot. <laughs> and I got more tired of doing that. 
of getting up at 6 in the morning to see if I had to shovel my driveway so I could go to work in the morning. And so I finally said yes after they gave me a nice golden parachute. The company that gave it to me was Allegheny Industries out of Pittsburgh. They owned a company called John Sink Company, which was a Tulsa firm that had an air conditioning component to it, but the bulk of the company was in heavy industrial burner technology. All the flares you see at all the refineries were built probably by that company. And so I said yes. And I went down there and started work on May 18th, 1987. And in July of 1987, Allegheny Industry, who was having financial problems and had all their various divisions up for sale, sold John Zink Company. So I looked at my golden parachute letter and I said, whew, that didn't last long. <laughs> and I said, what do I do now? Well, they told me, come down here. They said I had a blank check and I was to totally change this company and make something of it. I'm just going to go right ahead and do it. So I did. Most of the people in the firm who had been there a long time thought, whew, you're going to get fired. And I said, <laughs> yep. That's the way it goes. I had already made an awfully big commitment, and the big commitment I had made by that time was when I went down there, I had had, had a 25-year marriage, raised two wonderful children, a daughter and a son. And when I said I was going to take all of our money, which was considerable at that point in time, and I was going to invest in this company, my wife says, no, you are not going to do that. And I said, yes, I am going to do that. <laughs> and we collectively said, you know something? The marriage's not working real well. Maybe this is the time that I'm going to go do what I want and you go do what you want. And we sat down and divided it up and recognizing as I did that she had had an extraordinarily fine education, had given it all up to raise the children, I said, there's your half. And there her half was almost all of our net worth. So what did I have? I had my experience. And I had what I felt I needed to do what I wanted to do. And I didn't need to be able to buy all of the John Zink and own it all. All I needed to have was the ability to take my talent and employ it. And so we split. She took the money, never worked a day in her life since. And has had a very, has, is worth several million dollars. And I left, <clears throat> kind of change in my pocket. But I was able to sell my skills to a group of investors. And by the way, I maneuvered the ownership. I ended up with a significant ownership for not very much money. And they ended up with, the way I've structured it, they ended up with 95% loan and 5% equity. So when their 5% was equity and all of their loan was subordinated to the bank loan, we didn't start out with very much equity in this corporation. And if you had had one dollar of that equity, then I haven't run it here recently. Last time I ran it, your one dollar would be worth $25,000. That's how much that one dollar of equity. So I made a lot of people very wealthy people, myself included. And I pursued that. And because now I'm no longer married, I pursued it 24 hours a day, seven days a week to get the thing launched because we didn't have anything. We were a highly leveraged company. Come down to, do you believe in yourself? If you believe in yourself, then why aren't you willing to put the money where it belongs? Why aren't you willing to invest in yourself? Because I knew I knew how to pump gas. I knew how to change oil. I knew how to do a lot of things. I wasn't going to starve if I went bankrupt. I was 52 years old. I could go bankrupt. I could survive until I grow, was ready for time that I was going to retire. But it didn't happen that way. I would, right. I was right on myself. And we have, in 25 years, 
had 10.8% compounded growth for 25 consecutive years, sometimes up and sometimes down, but take the 25 years and that's what it figures. Profitability has increased 24% per year for 25 years. And the equity in the company has increased 26% in that time. So at any point when somebody got on, and there are probably a few of you who have some of our stock and realize that sometimes it wasn't doing real well, but if you kept it long enough and you got that total, you did extremely well. And then I was totally convinced, as I said, that I had to give back to the college and I got on the foundation board for a while, helped raise more money in one stop raising of money in the early 2000s that equaled all the money for scholarships that had been raised since the 1950s till that time. We passed that up in three years. So I felt very good about that. I was part of that. Done a lot of other things here. I've done a lot of things for Winifred. Done a lot of other things for people in other parts of the state you don't know about. But the big point is it comes back to me. Somebody's looking out after me. Because sometimes when things could go wrong, and I think they're going to, they go right. Why do they go right? What I'm trying to tell everybody here is how to be successful if you follow what I have done. Because it's very obvious looking at that picture that I didn't start out with silver plume in my mouth. So we get to a point in here and doing a lot of things and certain people, Jake Jabs stands up and he gives a big amount of money to the school, builds a beautiful building over here. And I say, ah, ah. <laughs> I think he's got a good idea. <laughs> and so we're in conversations earlier around here and I funded a study by a retired professor to see how the school could change its technology a little bit, not drastically, just modify it a little bit. Because I didn't think that it wanted to change a lot to give me a better education. But with a little slight of modification, of a little bit of cross-disciplinary training and business and a little bit in some other areas, I could have been better prepared. And fortunately, the study that he ran by talking to all the deans in the school came up so that they said that was a good idea. And that has materialized. It's been carried by the school on. And I've been a part of this conversation. And it finally got to the point where they said one of the biggest problems we have is we don't have a building that's appropriate for innovative teaching. And we also have a second problem. We are short on engineering classrooms. And so, okay, let's combine the two and put them central to the campus and really try and create something bigger than it is, bigger than this building. Let's try and make it more Let's try and change the dynamics of the school. And so across the street, which is kind of where it's been talked about and chosen to be, there's going to be phase one of what ultimately might be, if the school and everything goes, an additional portion of the campus. They have to have other places to grow. It's going to grow to the south. And this will be the anchor point to that growth that hopefully will occur sometime in the future. And so it has to be thought out very thoroughly. It can't be just dump a building out there. That's not going to do it. You've got to integrate it and it's got to have assurance it's going to go forth. And so we have come up with a plan that I was going to contribute $50 million to kick this plan off, but it's going to take more money. So I hope there's some people sitting here or hearing this conversation that are going to come up here and say, you know, 
this is the time for me to contribute to my school or to the school who might, which might not even be their school. Because it is such a superior school, it is doing so much for the society, it is giving out such good results, giving such good graduates. It's a good place to invest your money. And so the foundation board has taken it upon themselves to raise some more money and put this together. I have put stock equal in escrow, so they're assured the money's going to be there. I haven't done it yet. I've got to go back and get it done, but I will have it done. <laughs> It'll be there in probably a couple, three weeks. And I ask of you, if you have any ability to influence anybody or if you are capable of yourself, yourself in any way to help move this forward, because I think the school has done an enormously complete analysis of how they can change the dynamics of not just an engineering education, but of other schools' educations also in this innovative, collaborative, educational structure. Thank you much. Money comes right here. <laughs>